Hello, students. Um, welcome to the online lecture this week for Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. We're also going to be touching briefly on her uh, essay, Why I Wrote the Yellow Wallpaper, as well. So um, hang in there. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about uh, women in medicine and mental illness in the 19th century, treatments, stigmas, those kinds of things, specifically postpartum depression, um, because that really is what's at play here. I don't think in, um, uh, you know, 1892, um, the, uh, the average reader, or certainly even Gilman herself, and certainly not her doctor, Dr. Weir Mitchell, understood what postpartum depression was. Um, most women, I think, who had experienced it knew that there was something wrong. Frequently, they probably thought there was something terribly wrong with them. You know, the Victorian era, and this is the late Victorian era we're talking about here, was an era where um, that kind of idolized women's roles in childbearing and child rearing. And, uh, you know, your be all and end all was your children and your family and your home and all of those things were very, very important. Um, you know, that, that was what women were praised for, um, uh, for doing and their whole worth was wrapped up in, in those roles. And so imagine for a moment, uh, how difficult it would be for you as a woman who grew up with the idea that you're going to be taking on all of that, and then suddenly you can't do it. Uh, you can't care for your house. You can't look after your husband, your kids, and you are sad, depressed when everybody's telling you, oh, how wonderful you have a baby. Oh, that's wonderful. You should be really, really happy. And you're not. And it, it must have been terribly confusing. It must have been terribly difficult um, to say, I must be a terrible person because I don't feel happy. I should feel happy. I just had a child. I should feel happy, and I don't. So even women today who deal with this, um, and we're, we've just now started to scratch the surface of understanding what the causes are and what the treatments can be and those kinds of things. Even women today, even knowing all that, it's still a terribly difficult thing. So um, combine sort of Victorian expectations about women's roles with um, a lack of understanding about depression and mental illness at all. Um, and you're looking at a pretty lonely person. There's Gilman up there in the upper right-hand corner for, of your screen. This had to be an incredibly difficult and lonely thing because nobody understands why you haven't perked up. You know, cheer up. Um, people who suffer from depression just can't stand it when people say, oh, well, just cheer up. So it's just, it just demonstrates a complete lack of understanding about what, what you're up against. Um, now I think people understand a little bit more, but it's still really terribly rough. Combine that with the fact that in the 19th century, mil mental illness was something that that families were very ashamed of. Um, well, it depends on where you're from. I mean, there's an old joke that says that up north, if you had a, 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 a crazy relative, you put them in the attic. Down south, you put them on the front porch to wave at everybody who goes by. Um, we've all had some eccentric family members. But here we're talking about very serious mental illness, right? Schizophrenia, postpartum depression, depression in general, um, uh, bipolar disease, all those kinds of things. People, they're, they're things that people just didn't understand. And what made it worse, not only did they not understand it, not only did they not have treatment, um, it was something that families were ashamed of. If you had a family member who was mentally ill, you were ashamed of them, and you literally kept them in the attic, literally. OK, uh, that and children who um, suffered from any kind of developmental or physical disability um, had uh, friends once who bought a, a historic home in the upper Midwest. I think it was. Anyway, it was in the 1880s when the home was built. And there was a little room up there and it was a tiny room. It kind of overlooked the street, but it was kind of a small little area. They thought it was a closet. And the, uh, the, the real estate agent who knew a lot about historic homes said, oh, no, no, that's not, a, that's not a closet. That's a disappointment room. And they said, what do you mean? It's disappointingly small, that's for sure. What do you mean a disappointment room? In the, in the 19th century, middle class or upper middle class families who had a child who had some sort of difficulty, physical, mental, developmental, or what have you, they were sufficiently stigmatized by society such that they did not bring that child out in public, that they cared for the child in the home and in a particular part of the home, usually upstairs, possibly in a converted attic area, and they called it a disappointment room because it was disappointing that the child had not been born normal. 
Okay, that seems to us to be bizarre and cruel. It was the way they looked at things at the time. And so people looked at diseases and illnesses, particularly mental illnesses with respect to adults, uh, very differently from what they um, from what we do today though we're not where we should be probably on that score. The other thing is that different kinds of illnesses that we would not think are terribly, you know, stigmatizing, uh, difficult, yes, sad, yes, uh, awful to endure, but we wouldn't normally today stigmatize somebody for it. But I can remember even as a small child, people didn't talk about people who had cancer, for example. You whispered it. Now, I don't know why, but it was just treated that way. Oh, he has cancer, right? I mean, it was, you didn't talk about it. I, I suppose it was because it's too sad. The, the survival rates were so low. Um, people didn't want to bring up unpleasant topics. People didn't want to get people all sad because the prognosis for most cancer victims at the time was pretty low. About a hundred years ago, certainly it was. I bring all this up because sadly, Charlotte Perkins Gilman did die of cancer. Actually, she didn't die of cancer. She had terminal cancer and decided to take her own life. Um, the pain was very difficult for her and um, I don't judge, um, but it, it, it just very, very sad. So she struggled with not once, but twice medical uh, medical issues for which people just didn't, even professionals, didn't, didn't really offer an awful lot of help and certainly almost no understanding. Um, we bring up this fellow Weir Mitchell, I'm kind of jumping to the end, um, who was her physician and he's modeled sort of John, her husband, uh, the, the, the narrator's husband in this is kind of modeled on the kind of physician Weir Mitchell was. Um, and uh, Mitchell was one of the most famous doctors there was. I mean, consider him like the Dr. Oz or Dr. Fauci or Dr. Whoever. I and mean, he was like the most famous doctor in, in, the, in the United States at the time. And this guy, if you're in the healthcare professions, read up on him, especially after you've finished your education and know an awful lot about treatment and care. This guy was just pursuing a terrible, terrible protocol with his patients. So this is what he would do. He would say, um, and I'm skipping a kid. I'll, I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll bring that up now. What's at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, this guy's prescription was the rest cure, right? So if you're depressed, if you're suffering from sadness and depression, this is his, this was his prescription. Let us take you and isolate you, cut you off from all human contact. Make sure that you don't do anything all day long. No reading, no writing, no, no, don't go for walks. Don't do anything. Just lie in your bed alone right? Don't listen to music. Don't do anything. You just rest. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm certainly not a therapist. But even I know that one of the last things you want to do for somebody who's suffering from depression is to basically put them in solitary confinement. It's terrible. And of course, Gilman says later on in, the, in her why I, why I Wrote the Yellow Wallpaper was, I am an intelligent woman. I am an educated woman. I was following the directions of this quack, this crazy man. And I'm telling you now, this guy didn't know what the heck he was talking about. And she even publishes his name. Um, she even she even sent a copy of this to him um, when she had finished writing it. I mean, she, re she publicly vilified the man and said, this guy gave me a treatment that I, and I trusted him and I followed what he said because people said, trust the experts. Well, he was a so-called expert that nearly wrecked my life. Um, and, you know, there's something fundamentally wrong, she basically argues, with how we provide health care and mental health uh, care, for, especially for women. And this needs to change. Um, that, was a pretty, that was a pretty bold move on her part. And again, I think that a woman with less education and less social standing and less sort of toughness might have just said, oh, well, that's just my lot in life. But Gilman was pretty outspoken and was not going to sit quietly about it. I mean, she knew after all this was said and done that, um, you know, they th this this treatment was a fiasco and she was not going to be quiet about it anyway. OK, so so and, and and and, you know, Gilman, of course, endured. Uh, postpartum depression in 1887, um, Mitchell sort of eventually privately admitted, uh, okay, so my treatment was pretty crummy and not really the way to help women who have 
postpartum depression. They didn't call it postpartum depression, okay? Um, but uh, it was, I mean, it's, it, it, you know, he, he kind of quietly, privately admitted that he was way off on his diet. I mean, he, he was doing, I mean, you could almost argue that he was doing exactly the wrong thing, right? People who have depression, you should engage with them to the extent they're comfortable. You should not make them feel alone. You should not make them feel isolated or bored or whatever. I mean, you, you don't want to push them, but I mean, this is just a terrible idea. I mean, it's the worst thing in the world. It's like, it's like trying to treat somebody with a drug addiction or alcohol by saying, oh, no, no, here, have, have more, have more. Um, they already, they already feel alone. They already feel isolated. They already feel sad. They already feel bored. Um, this is not a treatment that's very good. Not that mental illness and alcoholism are the same thing, but um, you get the idea. Well, so, so she suffered through this herself. So this is somewhat autobiographical, not entirely autobiographical. But let's get into it because it's an interesting thing. At fir first of all, first question, how long did it take you into the story before you realized, oh, something isn't right here? You, you know, the narrator begins the short story by essentially saying, oh, we're, we're renting this summer um, country home to get out of the city. And they've brought their household with them. Obviously, they're like upper middle class. Uh, because they have a servant, Mary, um, and her husband, John, has brought his his sister, Jenny. Okay, try to get it all correct there if you can. We don't know the narrator's name. She doesn't give her name, okay? Um, but there's there's Mary, there's Jenny, okay? Mary's the housekeeper or the servant girl um, or nanny or whatever you want to call her. There's Jen, Jenny, um, I believe it's Jenny instead of Jenna. Um, the, uh, the husband's name is John and he is a physician. Okay. Um, and her other people in her family are physicians as well. And of course these are all male physicians and so on. So they decide, no, no, for your rest, we're going to put you in this upstairs room that she tells us it must have been a nursery. It must have been a playroom for children because, my goodness, look at how torn up it is. And you know how kids are. I mean, kids do all kinds of stuff. They jump up and down on the bed. They pull off the wallpaper on the walls. And, you know, there have to be bars on the window. What if a kid opened the window and jumped out or fell out while they were playing? Oh, my goodness, I can't have that. So that's why the bars are there. Oh, and by the way, you know, small children in a nursery, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, they're, they're, they're prone to, like pick up beds and move them, you know, large four poster, uh, queen size or king size beds. They can just move them around. Right. So that's why they're nailed down. And you know, kids, they love to chew on stuff. Oh my gosh. That's why the, the bed has gnawed marks on it and, and, and their teeth marks all over the, the, um, the headboard and the, and the posts and the rails and things. Maybe, I guess. There are rings on the walls, too, like little metal rings and ropes and things, which, you know, you know, kids, they, they love, oh gosh, they love gymnastics and things like that. And probably little kids doing yoga and stuff with those rings, right? It took you uh, maybe a few minutes, but after a while you realize, okay, that's not what we have here. Someone is putting her in the room because... This is the room. They rented the, the, the home with the express purpose of finding a home that has a room like that because they intend to put her up there until hopefully she's better, right? They're going to give her the rest cure and they're going to put her in the crazy person room, okay? A tiny mint little insane asylum. Um, and that, that, that is how they would have probably described it, right? We wouldn't do that today. We don't like to use terms like that because it's insulting to people who have mental illness. But that's essentially what they would have said. We're going to put her in, the, you know, the lunatic room. Um, and we're going to go have to go find a place this summer to put her in there until she's better. We got to give her this rest cure because she's really off her rocker. Um, and so, so it may have taken you a little while to figure that out, but after a while you're going, this, this ain't no nursery, right? Something funny is going on here. She, however, convinces herself that that's what it is, right? She allows herself to be, and you say, how gullible can you be? I think one of Gilman's points in the short story is to show you how dependent women were on the expertise of male figures like their husband or brother or father, and especially male figures like physicians, who even today people won't question. I'll just tell you personally, um, my mother 
uh, suffered from breast cancer and went and saw a physician because she wasn't feeling well when she was going through menopause. And this physician, knowing full well that she had had breast cancer uh, and a bad and a, and a bad uh, um, uh, period in her life with breast cancer, by the way, um, prescribed her hormone repra- replacement therapy because she was having difficulties with menopause symptoms. You don't do that. I mean, you just don't do that. And at the time, you know, we didn't really keep up with what was going on very much. But after the fact, we thought he lost it. Have you, are you kidding me? You don't, you don't do HRT with a woman who's had breast cancer. You look for some alternatives. But my mother never questioned it because she grew up in an era where you don't question doctors. You do what they tell you to do. If they say you take this medicine, you take this medicine because they're really smart and they know what they're doing. And you know, I, I, today we look at it and say, oh my gosh, don't don't worship people with an MD after their name, for heaven's sakes. They, they're, they're a bunch of people who are in the medical profession who may not know what the heck they're doing. Um, but that was from an era where people really, really looked up to doctors. And it, even more so in Gilman's age. So she, you, you say to yourself, well, why is this narrator so easily fooled by all this? Well, the answer is she's treated in an almost infantile way. Did you notice how, how, how her husband refers to her? He almost doesn't even treat her as an adult. He calls her his little goose. And he says stupid, icky, yucky, sicky, sweet crap like, oh, she'll be just as sick as she wants to be, the little thing. It's just awful. Um, even for that era, Gilman's reader would have said, eh, what kind of husband is this, right? It's even weirder that your husband is your physician and your lover. It's odd because he tells her, don't have any contact. What's the one thing that he tells her not to do, especially that she loves to do and has always loved to do? Write, okay? Writing. Um, and that's, that's her great joy. Now, but you didn't think of this. So if she was told, don't ever write, and this is in first person, did she obey the doctor's orders or not? No, she didn't. Because this is the written product of that, right? She couldn't almost help herself. In fact, she says that when Jenny comes up, she's got to hide her writing. Okay? So what you're reading is her writing. It's her diary, her journal, whatever you want to call it. And most 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 readers kind of go, oh, yeah, that's right. I guess it is, isn't it? So did she obey doctor's orders? No, she did not because she just felt like she couldn't help it. She's an incredibly creative, imaginative person. She even tells you in her childhood what a vivid imagination she had. I mean, she's born to write. The narrator, right? Gilman, too. But the narrator is somebody who was just born to write. And guess what, folks? If you are suffering from depression, what do therapists frequently ask you to do or invite you to do or encourage you to do? To write, right? Writing is therapeutic. So is art and music and other things like that are very therapeutic. And uh, again, I don't pretend to be a therapist. I just know some people who've been through therapy and people who are therapists. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. It's very, very helpful. I also teach writing for a living. And I know that it can be extremely therapeutic for people who are going through great difficulty. It's one of the first things that you ask children to do. Is to, is to create artwork or write out or write poems and things like if they've been through trauma, right? And so what's the one thing that she says, I really like this. I've always liked writing. I've always wanted to do it. I feel compelled to do it. I feel better when I do it. And they're telling her don't do it, right? I mean, this is kind of like topsy-turvy, crazy, mixed up, up and down and down and up kind of stuff here, right? The very thing that really would help her, they don't want her doing, and she does it anyway because she can't help it. It's what makes her feel better, okay? But she's a tremendously creative person, um, and she's writing about this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the account, obviously. But guess what? Her husband comes up and visits her at night, and there's a strong suggestion that there's intimacy there. So he kind of infantilizes her. He treats her as a patient, as kind of a little girl. He calls her his little girl. It's 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 weird. It's weird. Um, there are there are lines here. Look, I know I know married couples where one person is the physician and they might or a, or a nurse. And if there's a minor thing, they might say, "Oh, you need a little of this. I'll go down and 
you know, get you this or whatever, or I'll, or I'll write a prescription for you. You'll be all right. But nothing serious, right? I've never known a physician who is, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, his spouse or whatever, um, and, and, and makes major medical decisions about that person. No, you go get another physician just in case you're wrong, in case your judgment's off or whatever. You, you, you want a disinterested objective third party. So there's a little bit of a weird conflict of interest here. I guess it's handy to have a nurse or a doctor in the family, but sometimes it's really good to have somebody who's not doing that. Now, that wasn't the case, obviously, with Weir Mitchell. By the way, if you Google this guy, you'll find his great nephew, I think, is an actor right now, and he's named Weir Mitchell, and he was in some sort of horror show or whatever, horror movies or whatever, or TV show, I don't know. Um, so if you, you Google him, don't be surprised you find out one of his descendants is is popping up more often than he does. Um, so so it's an odd relationship with her husband, to say the least. His prescription for her is clear, but she doesn't follow it, right? Obviously, in the story, she descends into madness because of, you, you put the, the, the things together here. But essentially, she continues to comment about the woman in the wallpaper. She begins to see things in the paper, right? So the paper has this weird kind of design and it's been obviously scratched and pulled off and 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 you put wallpaper up with this kind of glue type substance, right? Today they use different kinds of adhesives than they did back then, but back then they used like really thick, sticky glue, right? So if you ever buy a Victorian home and it's got wallpaper and you don't like it, boy, you better think twice because man, it is a job getting it off of there, okay? Because they use different stuff than they do now, much thicker, um, high quality paper. They put it on there for real. Um, and so it's, you know, but somebody in that room has been just kind of d d tearing it, doing all these kinds of things. And there's even a smudge down on the bottom, down on the bottom, all the way around the room, a smudge. Now, she says eventually in the, in the piece that she noticed that there's a woman in the paper. And the reason why the paper's all messed up is because there's a woman in there. I can see her in the paper. She's behind bars and she's shaking the bars. And she says, I've noticed something. The woman gets out at night. Okay, and she goes around the room and she 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 hugs the wall, right? All the way around the room, right? Rubbing the wall with her shoulder, and that's why the smudge is there. And I've even seen her get out and go outside. Okay? So clearly she's detached from reality, right? But who is this woman? It's her alter ego. It's her that she's seeing doing this. And it's her, it's she who is becoming the woman in the wallpaper, right? So, did you catch this? Very interesting. She says, you know, even when I leave the room, I smell that wallpaper smell everywhere I go. Every, we even went out for a, a ride the other day in the carriage where I went downstairs and got out of the room for a bit, smelled that doggone wallpaper everywhere I went. And you know what else? Here's when I really smelled it. I would turn my head real fast. And I'd smell it a lot then. Why is she smelling it? Because it's on her. She's the woman in the wallpaper who's smooching around the wall, right? You see that at the end. It's got, oh, okay, now I know why she's smelling wallpaper all the time. Because it's all over her. Because she's the one rubbing. And it's in her hair. And it's all the smell is everywhere. So when you turn your head, you got a full head of hair. You know, you can, you can smell it, right? It's, it's, it's in your hair. Um, so, so there are a lot of little kind of interesting, creepy little details here that only afterwards, if you look back, especially if you read it a second time, you're like, oh, now I see. Um, this is what's going on. So we have what's called an unreliable narrator. I mean, Poe used an unreliable narrator all the time, and we see it over and over and over again. It's a very common kind of device. And usually unreliable narrators are not just are, are sometimes liars, but sometimes mentally they're not there, right? They're not stable. And so this is not terribly innovative in that regard, but it's 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 well executed. That's what I would argue, right? Uh, eventually the woman escapes, um, and uh, and you know Jenny goes up and says, "Oh my gosh, uh, you know the, our narrator, your wife is going nuts in the room. She's lost it. She's totally detached from reality." <clears throat> she takes the key, throws it out the out the window, and says, "Ha ha, you can't get in now." Eventually. They do get in, or at least her husband does, and he sees her there. Now, 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 let's take a look at that because some people are like, "What? What's going on there?" 
Understand that at that point, she has become not herself, but the woman in the wallpaper. Okay, so if you're worried about like the proper names and pronouns being used here, understand that she is still John's wife. She has lost touch with reality, but she has become this person in the wallpaper. And frequently when she's speaking, she's speaking as the woman as, instead of as herself. John comes in and she says, um, here's what she says towards the end. Why, there's John at the door. It's no use, young man. You cannot open it. Right? Why does she call her husband young man? Because she's she's taken on the persona of the woman in the wallpaper, not herself anymore. How does he call how he does call and pound? Now he's crying for an axe. It would be a shame to break down that beautiful door. John dear, said I in the gentlest voice, the key is down in the front steps under a plantain leaf. That silenced him for a few minutes. Then he then he said, very quietly indeed, Open the door, my darling. I can't, said I. The key is down in the front door under a plantain leaf. And then I said it again several times, very gently and slowly. So perhaps she's going back and forth between being the woman in the wallpaper and being herself. But clearly she's she's not all there right at that point. And said and said it so often that he had to go and see. And he got it and he got off it and he got and he got it, of course, and came in. He stopped short by the door. What is the matter? He cried. What, for God's sakes, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane. And, I, and I'll put, and, and it could be that her name is Jane, the, the narrator, the wife's name is Jane. And now she's in the voice and in the persona of the woman in the wall. Hey, you and, and, and your wife, Jane, that you've been keeping in this room, tried to keep me in that wallpaper, but I got out. So it would, um, it, it, that, that's what most people kind of read. So, so you get like, who's this Jane person? It's the narrator. It's the real narrator instead of the woman in the wallpaper who she's speaking as, right? I've got out at last in spite of you and Jane, and I've put off most of, and I've pulled off most of the paper. So you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path by the wall, so that I had to creep over him every time. Every time when? She's continually going round the room and round the room. And when she gets to him, he's fainted, he's passed out. She just creeps right over him and keeps going around the room. And there he is and goes around over him and around the room and around the room. And o steps over him and goes around, right? And so that's the end of the short story. So it, the, the, the ending is confusing. When you have a narrator who's not mentally all there, it can be confusing. But I think that's probably the best explanation. It's the one that most people go with is that is that the, the, the husband's name is John, the woman with postpartum depression, his wife is named Jane, but she's speaking at that point in the voice of, in the character of, in the persona of the woman in the wallpaper who has no name. His sister's name is, is Jenny. Their housekeeper's name is Mary. So hopefully that kind of clears all that up. But that's the, run, the risk you run when you write a story with an unreliable narrator, okay? Now, I'm going to give you all a break with no quiz this week. No quiz and no discussion because we have reader response due and next in the middle and next week on Thursday we have our midterm exam. Okay, so we're not going to do a quiz here, but this material will be part of the midterm exam. This will be the last reading that's part of what will be included and tested on the midterm exam. Okay, so please make sure you get your your um, your reader response into me by the deadline and make sure that you give yourself ample time to review for the exam. If you have questions about it, feel free to reach out. To me and email me about either of those. I'll be happy to help you, okay? So no quiz, no discussion this week on this. We'll give you a little bit of a break, but uh, we will see you for the midterm on Wednesday. I'm sorry, Thursday, right? Gave you all a heart attack. Sorry. <laughs>